ourselves. Um, and so while all of these prisoners might not hunger strike for the same reasons, um, so whether they're asking for medical care or release or prisoner exchange, they all experience and express their individual freedom or their individual demands as part and aspiration of uh, for practice of, of collect, uh, practices of collective freedom and being on the road to achieving this collective freedom. Um, and so they assert the sense of ownership that they have over their own lives, their bodies, their narratives, their decisions, um, and also their fate. Um, they decide whether they want to continue this hunger strike until they're martyrdom, like Sheikh Khadr Adnan did. And so it's actually a life affirming battle um, that restores their full personhood through an embodied prax praxis of, of Sunnah. Um, it also um, uh, it also you know builds this uh, community structure within the prisons. Um, and to talk about another form of, of, of resistance uh, within prisons and uh, which, which requires this process of community, community building and collective struggle within the prison, um, we can talk about the communication networks that are coordinated uh, by, uh, through, by captives um, in different prisons. Um, and so through that they can coordinate strike days together um, they can correspond with each other, um, they can correspond between different communities, they can send messages to, to the outside world um, and also to each other. Um, they can coordinate things like the, the legendary um, escape from the Gulbala prison in 2021 where six Palestinian political prisoners have managed to escape using things like um, spoons. And so this structure of community building um, actually transcends the, actual, the physical boundaries between prisons and also within prisons. So like, think about the cells and the buildings in which prison, prisoners are held. Um, and this can also you know, take the form of sperm smuggling uh, to, to counteract this attack or resist the attack on generationality and futurity. Um, Spring smuggling has been um, one of the most uh, successful um, resistance tactics of Palestinian prisoners. Um, and, and there have been many Palestinian children born through this act of, of spring smuggling, which, if you really think about it, is one of the most, um, the, the clearest acts of defiance that a political prisoner uh, can take against the Zionist colonial project which actually requires the elimination of this political prisoner and their family and their people as a condition of possibility. And so this this insistence on um, on resisting and staying steadfast in the struggle um, is what uh, Dr. Elina Mayari, who is a professor, Palestinian professor in his and in Ramallah, calls um, a revolutionary becoming. Um, so it's a, a, a becoming in a sense of refusing to recognize um, and surrender uh, to the power structures of settler colonialism. Um, and it's a formation that uh, a becoming is in a constant practice that is never finished or fixed. Um, it's never fixed as one form of resistance and it will never finish until liberation is achieved. Um, and I also want to um, refer to Dr. Ashjan Ajou, who's also a Palestinian um, academic, um, who, who um, wrote a book called Reclaiming Humanity in Palestinian Hunger Strikes. Um, she writes that, the, that through the weaponization of one's own body uh, during the hunger strike or during uh, the process of soul smuggling or um, during uh, the process of escape, literally escaping from colonial dungeons, the prisoners reclaim their own humanity, when, which, which the colonizer aims uh, to dispossess them of, of this humanity. Um, and so the body is actually employed as an instrument of resistance and to protect the soul um, and um, to, to also um, utilize the body as, as a means of protesting against the colonizer's project of, of constant dehumanization. And she also writes that um, the Palestinian soul is, is inextricably connected to this idea of resistance and dignity. 
Um, and so in the context of freedom fighters who are part of, um, of guerrilla combat um, forces or hunger strikers or Palestinians who attempt to and do escape prisons, um, she shows that when they're murdered, yes, the body dies, but it's the soul that remains immortal. Um, and so the body might collapse in a hunger strike or um, in a bombing or because like what I'm trying to say is that the, the effect of, of using one's body to liberate your own self and your people and your land will extend beyond the confines of, of, of the geography in which you are fighting for your freedom. It will extend to us here in Turtle Island. It will extend to Palestinian exile elsewhere. It will extend, extend to all people who are um, fighting against imperialism and colonialism. And so this protection and strengthening of the soul is really what enables the, the freedom fighter to withstand and defy the, the physical and physiological pain um, of, of martyrdom or of forced star or, or of, uh, of starvation. And so, you know, this, this battle of uh, hunger striking or the battle at large for liberation um, actually affirms life, not death. It's a battle for life free of occupation, uh, free of prisons, free of carceral systems that require the elimination and exclusion of, of a people. Um, because what colonialism and imperialism are, um, are life-taking projects. And so to affirm um, and reclaim um, your life through fighting for your freedom, whichever form that may take, um, because you're motivated by first hope um, and belief that you will be and your people will be liberated, but also love for your life um, and for your land and for your people and love for the future that you know is certain, even if it won't be, you know, for your generation, it will be for the next generation. And so these freedom fighters and people who are engaged in this political struggle are prepared for the death of, of, and martyrdom of their body in exchange for the life of their souls and their struggle. Um, and so, you know, there's also this belief that when the body surrenders um, and is martyred to the brutality of Zionist settler colonialism or, or the carceral regime, it's the soul that elevates towards a redeeming afterlife. And this is really what mobilizes people um, to, to utilize their bodies um, as a weapon. And so what, what we have here on Turtle Island, as people who are living in the belly of the beast, um, or as Palestinians in the diaspora, wherever we are, is that we have actually a real and material stake in, in the struggle to free political prisoners um, and to abolish the prison system in its present, present form, but that requires an understanding um, of the, the Zionist, uh, sorry, of the settler colonial state um, and the way that it functions. And so that requires an understanding of, uh, uh, of impoverishment, of policing, of courts, of prison systems as um, integral elements of ghettoization. Um, it also um, uh, requires an understanding of the impacts of our lives here on Turtle Island in the Valley of the Bees on, uh, on colonized and oppressed peoples um, in Palestine or elsewhere. Um, and so what we see maybe as um, or what we can see sometimes as um, an overwhelming and invincible beast that is uh, colonialism and imperialism and the brutality of Zionist settler, uh, Zionist settler um, carceral, uh, uh, the, the Zionist settler carceral project, um, is that uh, what we might see as that, as that is actually the, the minority. It's the people who are struggling for their liberation, the people of the third world, the people who are um, who are impoverished 
um, the workers, um, the colonized, who are the majority. It's the colonized and the oppressed who mobilize collectively against these systems of oppression. Um, and so that means, you know, abolishing prisons actually requires abol abolishing white supremacy as, um, as a colonial um, and imperialist project. It means abolishing capitalism and imperialism. Um, and so you can't you know, dismantle the carceral system without actually dismantling the carceral state and the national security state, which affects people abroad just as much or more than it affects people on, on Turtle Island um, because of the way that imperialist hegemony um, uh, works. Um, and so understanding policing and the police in and of itself in this international context um, will actually clarify that the balance of forces is the opposite. What we might see as a really um, super, uh, uh, like a, an extraordinarily powerful um, uh, force um, is, is, being, uh, is facing resistance from the majority of the world. Um, and so what, what, we, what, what America's what is called the pig majority in America or in North America mm -hmm. is actually the global, the global minority. Um, and it's the constituency for, for abolition way beyond what we see just on Turtle Island, way beyond the prison on Turtle Island, way beyond the carceral systems on Turtle Island. Um, and this is just a reminder that resistance to the global police state as an extension of, of imperialist hegemony has always existed. It will always exist because there will always be more of us than there is of them. Um, and I think I am going to, to stop here, but I want to finish with, um, with, uh, with, one, with two things. The first is um, uh, uh, Palestinian Feminist Collective's um, principle from our calendar last year about Sumut. And the second will be um, just a quote and also a very urgent and, and acute reminder uh, from, from the martyr Sheikh Khaled Ardman. Um, and so I'll, I'll read our statement on, on Sumud and steadfastness. Um, Palestinian prisoners teach us that Sumud is a revolutionary existence enacted through patience, resilience, def defiance, and devotion to liberation. Sumud animates our spiritual, emotional, physical, and psychological power and commitment to life beyond colonial violence and authority. We refuse to break under the threat and torture of our colonial and imperial captors. We will not disappear despite settler colonial designs that mandate our annihilation. We endure and persevere in the collective struggle until all prisons are dismantled and, sit, and until all of us are free. And um, what Sheikh Khadr Adnan, what the martyr Sheikh Khadr Adnan tells us um, uh, is indeed we were created free and we will remain so. The hunger strike is the key to our liberation from prisons, even if the cost is our lives. And this is not to say that everyone should go on a hunger strike because the hunger strike is actually a real a political strategy that seeks material gains. This is just um, an indication of what Palestinians who are, again, facing this extraordinary violence and killing machine um, are willing to sacrifice for, for the liberation of their people and their land and by extension um, creating the ripple effect for the liberation of all oppressed peoples uh, of, of the world. So yeah, thank you everyone for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
and Palestinian Feminist Collective. That was awesome. Um, we're going to take a couple minutes before we start on our next speaker. So yeah, get some refreshments if you need. Look at the zines. We'll, we'll start again in like four or five minutes. All right, cool. Okay, a lot. 
sometimes, sometimes it's zero. Um, yeah, these are the places you can learn more about the work the Invisible Institute does, um, our IG and Twitter as well. Um, we go to the next slide. So one of the projects that the Invisible Institute does as a nonprofit journalism organization is archival records, um, sort of bringing together both personal narratives and legal documents that are donated to us. Um, in the 80s and 90s, a crew of officers led by Commander John Birch tortured and coerced confessions from more than 100 black people. 100 is a really, really conservative low estimate. That is just describing the people who are exonerated so far. Um, and what is really unique about the organizing attached to this, um, if you go to the website, there's an activist timeline, some really cool lessons to learn from it, is that this long-running campaign from the late 80s led by mothers of the incarcerated, the incarcerated people themselves, and then people, attorneys, journalists, artists, etc., cetera, um, maintaining that campaign from the early 90s all the way to 2015 when they got the reparations legislation passed in the Chicago City Council. Basically, they guaranteed um, free college for the children and grandchildren of the survivors. It gave money to all the survivors at that time. It's a pretty small fund, but um, it's only a few million dollars. But it's also a funding and permanent commitment to a public memorial that should break ground later this year. Um, to the creation of a torture justice center that has reentry services employment services, therapy, et cetera, um, and a few, other, a few other things, but it included also a formal apology and recognition of the city and the mandate to teach it in eighth grade and 10th grade public schools, the, the history of this. So we are involved in making sure the reparations package is actually implemented, especially as it pertains to maintaining the history and making sure that it's taught in schools. Um, yeah, so if, if folks want to learn more about the story, we're not going to actually talk too much about like literally the torture cases, so if you are interested in more, I recommend you go to this website. Um, next slide, please. Now, um, the presentation we're going to share with you today is really, really Chicago-specific, but I did want to just provide one, just, just one local example of how a similar project can be done for tracing the connections between the NYP and torture cases, or NYPD, and the ongoing militarism. Um, um, one example that is relatively well known among people who study torture is um, the FBI files from the from the 2000s, early 2000s, 2002. Um, New NYPD was called upon to also serve in the Joint Terrorism Task Force, and so. When um, an NYPD officer, this is very similar to CPD, was called upon to serve these like tours in Guantanamo, they are they are incentivized in a variety of ways to like go serve whatever that means, whether that means interrogations or what have you, and um, be able to still collect their salary from New York. Um, and then I don't know this specific officer. Um, but it is very likely that they were, you know, valorized, got promotions, et cetera. That's, that's the pattern that we saw in Chicago. And so if people are interested in investigating that, um, there are a lot of resources online um, for New York. So yeah, this is just, a, this is a written report by an FBI, um, by one of the interrogators who wrote about his own work at Guantanamo. Um, and you know, he's proud of it. And so one thing I'd say with all the research we're about to present is that a lot of the information we share was self-disclosed by the officers, whether it's like on LinkedIn, on Facebook, um, in a variety of like news articles. And because a lot of US military practices are not necessarily you know, subject to Freedom of Information Act, um, or are not necessarily considered public information because of like Homeland Security excuses, um, that means that it is harder to get information about who served in the military and who did what. And so a lot of it relies on like going through social media and drawing those connections for yourself. All right. We can jump to the map. Yeah. Um, so for context, um, this is the Chicago Police Department. 
uh, Guantanamo Bay, but also like other places too, uh, like for the, for the Gulf War, for the Vietnam War. Um, and we're not going to go through the entire map just because there's a lot of information and it's pretty dense. But if you want to check out, it's, um, there's a lot of information on it. Um, so yeah, we're just going to go through some of the slides. Uh, yeah, thank you, Maya. Um, so yeah, Maya touched on John Birch and his affiliates and how they tortured over 125 black people. Um, and basically everyone in Earth Hawaii died for a long time, like city officials, the higher ups in the police department, and these officers routinely framed innocent men. And a lot of times the cases that they were working on were high profile and there was an expectation to find the person who committed the crime. And the Illinois Torture and Relief Commission is still investigating a backlog of more than 540 claims of torture. Um, and a lot of uh, people who have claimed to have been tortured are still incarcerated to this day. So it's an ongoing battle to get justice for them. One of the officers um, related to, or like in John Burke's network is Richard Zuli, who joined the Chicago Police Department in 1970. He's infamous for his torture at Guantanamo Bay, but he also actually took the leave of absence from CPD from 1982 to 1987 to do counterintelligence for the U.S. Navy. We don't have exact details on where he was deployed, exactly what he was doing, or how that influenced how he uh, behaved as a CPD officer later on. So when Zuli came back to Chicago after uh, being in the counter terrorism unit for the U.S. Navy, he was uh, assigned to the Area 3 police station. He briefly overlapped with John Burge, um, and then, but then John Burge was eventually fired. It's not in official records that the two ever worked together, but they did have a lot of mutual colleagues. And over the span of Richard Zuli's career as a Chicago police officer, he tortured at least five individuals that we know of. One of those was Lee Harris in 1988, who actually served as Zuli's close informant at a certain time. Um, yeah. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about the Gulf War. Yeah. So the Gulf War is really interesting uh, to study as an example of the ways we can think about the U.S. military products today and the connections we can think about drawing between what's happening in Palestine now and what the ripple effects might be in the years to come. So um, one of the obvious like underlying assumptions of, of this research is that um, a lot of the police officers are incentivized in a variety of ways to be in the reserves, to serve in the military, continue to collect, be able to collect uh, two like forms of payment, right? They still get paid by the police department in Chicago, and then they come back, and because of the right like valorization, they get they get promoted. And so we have a lot of um, infamous torturers who, or you know, officers of misconduct who served in the military. Um, so the Gulf War, one of the ripple effects um, from the early '90s, is this guy named Kenneth Boudreaux, who is still around, like, working, like, leading a private security company in his retirement. Um, but he is actively, his cases are actively investigated. He's been named in at least 46 torture claims um, along with a guy named Michael Kittle. And he worked in the Gulf War. He took a leave of absence for a year. Um, and then at the end of his career in CPD, not only was he, like, continued to be promoted, he actually helped design the Chicago Public Schools social media surveillance unit. And he was a commanding officer in the gay school safety team. So to this day, we still continue to investigate cases in which he's named um, in our wrongful convictions unit at the Invisible Institute. And he continues to deny any wrongdoing. He like very much like is a driver of the sort of like um, other truth, and he believes that he's done everything he's supposed to do. Now, if you go to the next uh, slide, if you scroll, one of his infam infamous cases that a lot of people pay attention to now within the torture justice space is um, of a young uh, black teenager, Johnny Plummer. He was 15 when he was coerced into confession by Kenneth Boudreaux and Michael Kill. And he has been fighting his case 
um, suing since 1991. Um, the most recent uh, update is that in early, uh, in late 2021, he won his appeal, a very hard fought appeal, to present new evidence that can exonerate him. Um, and, and one thing that has been incredible to watch is like the mothers of other survivors um, and the other survivors themselves continue to show up you know, year after year to fight for his freedom. Um, and we see this across the board. But Kevin Pedro, yeah, he, he is responsible for this. He's known for um, handcuffing him to a radiator and bringing him on the wall and interrogating him for almost 40 hours um, and torturing him into confession at Area 3. Area 3 is a, is a police station. Um, go to the next slide. Yeah, so going back to um, Officer Richard's relief, why I mentioned earlier that he had taken a leave of absence to work in counterterrorism for the U.S. Navy, he ended up taking another leave of absence from the Chicago police to go be a senior interrogator at Guantanamo Bay from 2002 to 2004. And there, he tortured Muhammad al-Sahi into a confession using many different awful forms of torture. And uh, another thing that was mentioned in Spencer Ackerman's report for The Guardian, uh, a lot of those techniques that he used at Guantanamo Bay, he had used on Chicago residents while he was a police officer there. So we see the connections between these forms of torture that are um, utilized locally and then used abroad. And um, uh, a really cool thing about Slahi, he still speaks a lot about his experience at Guantanamo Bay. He spoke with us when we presented this map at um, an exhibit at the Duval Art Museum, and he also has written a memoir about his experiences called uh, Guantanamo Diary. So, highly recommend people looking him up and um, yeah, just reading his memoir. But yeah, so Richard Dooley started in Chicago, then did counterterrorism for the U.S. Navy, back to Chicago, Guantanamo Bay, and then once again, back to Chicago, where he actually took on John Burge's old position, which is being the commander of police unit 630. And then he ended up retiring from CPD in 2007 and held various jobs within Chicago. For example, he worked for the Cook County Department of Health. He also worked for the Chicago Department of Aviation. Um, until 2017. And as far as we know, at the time that we published this map, Richard Dooley has been living in Florida, collecting his attention. So he's just living his life, and there's been absolutely no accountability um, with him. So fast forwarding a bit to more recent history that some folks are more familiar with. Um, in the US's invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq, um, we've seen, you know, we don't have public information in terms of like which officers in the Chicago Police Department took leaves of absence to take a tour, um, but we are able to string together from a variety of press releases. And again, LinkedIn was a big source, um, the cops love LinkedIn. Um, Facebook, of course, too. Yeah, the are on there. Um, and something that started to feel important to include in this map is like the what feels like a very relatively present day Chicago history. Um, our high rise public housing in Chicago was demolished in the early 2000s, and it um, with horrible, like horrible abuse of the police there and also just other government agencies, a lot of those people were not rehoused. So it is a, it is a devastating displacement event in Chicago. During that displacement, um, the Chicago police were able to act with impunity throughout. And um, we have seen, based again on self-disclosure, um, a handful of these like really notorious officers who are responsible for millions and millions of dollars of settlement for misconduct in the city. Um, had a history of, of being in um, Afghanistan, working at Bagram Air Base, which is known for its interrogation techniques as well. Um, these cops would invade homes without warrants, of course. They stole money, they would kidnap people. Um, 
And there's, there's a lot of additional investigation on that in it. Um, we can go to the next slide. So coming back to something Mohin said in the beginning of our intro, our origin story is the Invisible Institute. Um, Diane Bond, wonderful person who lived in Stateway Gardens, um, she was assaulted, um, her home raided, um, sexually violated, and you know threatened multiple times um, by a crew of officers um, in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Um, she sued the police, as Mohin said, in 2003. Um, and you know all these officers are now are still alive, of course. Um, unlike John Birch, who died a while ago. Um, it's really important to, yeah, well, he died of cancer, so it was sort of like, it's not like we got justice from John Burge or something. Um, but uh, these guys are still around, right? Like, we're able to look them up online, and I met one of their wives randomly recently. Like, they are in society. Um, so when we go to the next slide, we did a deep dive, and we're trying to figure out where these monsters are um, and what they do. Can we look at the captions? Thank you, you're good, I know it's bad. Um, so this group of officers have been named in one of the 20 federal lawsuits. Um, and all of them, at the time of publishing this map, were still a part of the Chicago Police Department. The one guy who wasn't, Joe Sinus, actually just retired so that he could take on a very lucrative contract of advising the Department of Defense throughout Iraq. He disclosed this on his LinkedIn um, saying that he led the CLEAT anti-terrorism unit, he posted photos of the SWAT team he worked with, um, he described it as capture kill missions to restore peace in the Long Island Iraq. Um, and since 2016, he describes his role in the Department of Defense as classified. Go to the next slide. Um, and yeah, like I said, it, it is important to to question and think about any organizing we do related to our like hyper local police operations as an extension of fighting U.S. imperialism in the military, right? And the point of this research is to better understand the way that it is the same machine and very intertwined, even if like these other local governments don't see it as such um, and don't describe it as such. Um, it goes beyond the more the better covered um, examples of like. Weapons donations or money, you know, like or money funneling. Um, when we see cops getting out on the trains in New York, right? A lot of train-related policing comes from anti-terrorism money, um, and and so I think it is important to draw these examples. But thinking about how we fight imperialism that can be so overwhelming, focusing in a very low, hyper-local way is still fighting that fight. Um, so. Yeah, I just also wanted to, to highlight one detective, um, Dante Servan. There is a case of, um, in 2012, this man, Dante Servan, an off-duty police officer, killed a 22-year-old young black woman, Rakita Boyd. Um, this man had previously um, trained police in Kosovo and Mexico. Two months after her death, he went to Honduras to lead a national police team on homicide investigations. And since 2017, he has been an international police advisor in Honduras. And so, again, sometimes working super hyper locally in Chicago and feeling overwhelmed by things that are happening internationally, um, it is to our advantage to better draw these international connections and, and understand that it's not only just like theoretically fighting the same fight, it is quite often literally the same people that we are fighting. Um, and then, just to, to wrap up this map, um, the, the point of, uh, or the reason we did this research, we were, we were asked to look into um, basically the connections between John Burge specifically, and if you go to this map, the first like 75 to focus on the, that story, um, he had started to be an um, um, and some of the torture techniques he learned there, like black box interrogations, this is basically electrocuting people, was also a technique used in Vietnam. It's not clear if he did it there, but um, but we realized over the course of, it, of doing this investigation that trying to make sense of such monstrous behavior, like truly no other way to describe it, um, it is not necessarily that 
there is like one thing, one specific trauma you can point to in Vietnam or someone's war experience that like turned them into this, right? Um, and I think there is a desire to like figure out that perfect solution sometimes. And it's certainly, yes, I'm sure there's traumatic things that contribute to it. But this um, researcher, Corey Peterson, at the Institute for Middle East Studies, really helped me understand this. He said, I think there was this idea that something special happened in John Burge in Vietnam, and that explains why he would do something so monstrous. And obviously, lots of things happen to people who are in combat, combat and it is a wildly traumatic experience. But look at the world John Burge grew up in. Look at the world Richard Zuli grew up in. You grow up in the United States, and you are primed to then go and commit and develop and hone forms of violence elsewhere and bring it back here. It's the most ordinary thing in the world for the U.S. to support and incubate violence, and then not just import it, but be in a relationship to it. So as we think about world building, um, redefining standards of like what it means to exist in the U.S. and work in the U.S. Um, and make sure that the young people that grow up here are not growing up in a condition where it it is not considered a natural outcome to grow up and to commit these acts of war, um, and instead be able to create acts that are actually quite generative and allow us to not meet the police. Thank you. Um, if we can go back to that slideshow, we have just, I think, one more slide. Yeah, um, we have some time left, and so we wanted to make space for for questions. I know there's a ton of information, um, and so if there are questions or honestly reactions, things that surprised you, um, I think something that is often helpful in conversations around this presentation is a lot of information around the military has to be crowdsourced, and it's like I was saying, it's hard to get the government to release data. So. If other people have examples of connections between the New York police and the military, I'd be super interested in hearing it, and I think it would help other people to know it too. One example I offer is like the New York Police Department had a department or station in the Philippines for a really long time. I think that's often a cited example. Um, have other people heard of other connections between New York and the U.S. military?
Okay, so to recap for folks who didn't hear, thank you, Daryl, for speaking here, um, is to summarize, um, as like a financial capital of the country, and also Bloomberg being one of the like wealthiest, most powerful people within that class, a lot of um, these financial firms like Goldman Sachs, they have uh, philanthropic work, and I forget sometimes that uh, technically there you can donate to police departments, um, and that is how actually a lot of Western Chicago as well gets funding to do specific work, and so that's why I hope that they continue to donate to anti-terrorism specifically. Um, let's go here and then to the back person speaking. Thank you. 
Uh, you said of Jared, what? Jared Shanahan. Champaign-Urbana, um, which is where like, the University of 
Illinois Chicken of Man, and as people know, um, and yeah, the public defender's office told us that um, having this data be public is really useful for them because for them, if they have, um, if they're working with a client and it's related to a police officer, they can't, if they request any documentation, they have to prove that that officer has had complaints filed against them before. So they basically have to prove that complaints against them exist in order to get complaint files. So they're stuck in like a weird catch-22. So for them, like if they have um, a different way to see that complaints have been filed against an officer, um, like, like through our data pool, then it's like easier for them to like see that data. So yeah, like just, Echo and Omar said like it's really useful for public defenders because they have to jump through a lot of hoops sometimes to be able to get access to these same files. Um, so yeah, I think that's really helpful. And then also I think for community members, it's just important for them to have transparency and see like what are the police officers in my community doing. Um, we know in, in 2020 a lot of people were using CPD being in Chicago at like during the uprisings at protests. Um, like if a police officer was, was at the protest, they could pull up their profile and say like, this is what your record looks like. And yeah, I think it would be really um, interesting if we were able to get that same sort of information for the military because that feels like such a black box of information that we can't get access to. All right, y'all, that's our time. Thank you so much for coming to talk and visit. You can learn about our other work, our podcasts, and the great investigation at invisibleinstitute.com. Thank you all.
If you came to our lab of salt toxicity, even you might know a little bit about um, toxicity, or I probably heard about it by now, but here's for the nerdy. Uh, so, the salt toxicity is a detective word who's been a connect policing and the prison abolition with the environmental justice in the fight against the building of a $90 million multi police facility in the long for Occupy the Philippines. I think the price tag is actually now about $120 million. So the things that I never actually get to do with the video here. Um, so the South Africa movement has a really terrible characteristic to the youth-led no-cop academy movement during Ron Emanuel's mayorship regime um, in Chicago seven years ago now. Uh, and I'll get into that in a few. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about Palestine in relation to the school and cop city. So, how does cost to connect to Palestine? Um, today's land day, we cannot talk about one without talking about the other. And the cost city is a manifestation of the relationship between deadly pain programs, private capital, private organization, and settler colonial occupation of all white currency. Uh, Gilly, or the Georgia International Law Enforcement Exchange Program, is a really state based police exchange program between the Atlanta Department. The Atlanta Police Foundation Leadership Institute and the Israeli Occupation Forces. This program was created to ensure the exchange of tactics and capital under the guise of Homeland Security. And the same corporations that fund top city like Chick fil A, Coca Cola, and that private capital into the game. They're funding to send hundreds of AP trainees from Georgia to the Zion Tennessee to refine the practices of urban warfare. The blueprint for top city was literally inspired by Israel's own property uh, called Little Gavel in Anacabo, the so-called Miguel Desert. Israel's property is in the Lugan Southern Palestinian land, and Jordan's property is in the Lugan Forest, which is 381 acres of stolen stolen land, and I don't know the stolen land. The whole country is stolen land, but anyway. Um, this relationship symbolizes the connection between the prison industrial complex, militarism, and against state sanctioned violence against working class black and indigenous communities. Since the early 2000s, thousands of police departments, border patrol, and FBI have trained with the IOS um, as part of these kind of parallel exchange programs. Um, and these exchange programs have to do with the post 9 11 development of so called counter terrorism technology and tactics in both policing and immigration policy. The US learns the tactics of the occupation. Specifically, the gold standard um, at the level of leasing and bring those values back home to increase criminalization against black and brown people, surveil Muslims, repress indigenous black movements, the name of you. Um, there are at least 28 states with exchange programs, Georgia and New York State included. So, before Cop City in Atlanta, there was a movement to stop Cop Academy. In Chicago, um, I'm going to do a really quick abridged history of what No Cop Academy was um, with a little context setting. So, Ron Emanuel closed half of Chicago's three mental health clinics and about 49 public schools in black neighborhoods specifically in 2012 and in 2013. In 2014, Chicago police officer Jason Van Dyke murdered. 17-year-old Juan McDonald. Um, and this is part of uh, problems in Chicago related to racist disinvestment, um, the continuous cutting of education programs, and other um, alternatives to uh, policing. So in the summer of 2017, Ron Emanuel announced that the CPD who at the time was receiving 40% of the annual budget, which was about $1.7 million at the time, would get a new $170 million investment in the form of a state-of-the-art training facility with all the other schools. Lots of these blocks, traffic raids, military tactics, shooting range, and swimming pool, pool, and a food court, and a bunch of other things. Uh, the location was um, going to be a 30 acre rail, railroad yard in the west side of Chicago next to West Garfield Park, which is a black working class neighborhood. And then there was a lot of the coalition was born in opposition to the project. 
Well, the profit academy finished um, its introduction in January 2023 despite six years of opposition um, by the folks of Chicago. The no cost academy movement didn't entirely lose, right? So their demands were that the city not increase spending on the police department, which is already per capita one of the most well founded um, in the nation, I think, right next to New York City. Um, and instead, we direct the public funds to resources that help prevent violence, like high quality public education, affordable housing, and home health services. So the, the No Profit Academy um, campaign fell short of the goal of stopping the city from improving its construction facility, but at the same time, uh, achieved really important victories that helped strengthen the community organizing. Um, and long-term efforts to divest from the harms of policing, not just in the Chicago context, but actually in the context of the U.S. Um, no Cop Academy played a huge role uh, in the development of young leaders. Um, they built a broad multiracial coalition, and they won um, political support from elected officials on what was a an unacceptable demand, which was around our women. So. As Chicago organizers, probably a lot of us in the room um, know very well, the message of abolition has long been deemed too radical uh, for mainstream political discussions, even those sometimes facilitated by the left at the time, anyway. By exposing the city's hypocritical claims of being broke when it closed half of its mental health clinic and 49 public schools only years prior. No problem having any challenge that narrative that asks, well, Chicago can find money to build police uh, these giant um, projects, but they can also find money to be able to educate our community um, instead of investing in a higher level of police force. What if we reverse spending flow and divesting from the failed institution of policing to instead invest in the support of the system? Um, that bring people from preventing to fighting. Um, the coalition challenged mainstream journalistic practices, which treat policing, education, and housing as separate conversations, and they argue that a holistic approach to the social and economic justice is the only answer to ending the systemic violence. And so, because we're talking about uh, different liberation movements, um, I wanted to Rather than a little bit of dialectical materialism, um, using Bradley Bob's question about the time on the clock of the world. Um, so Bradley and her husband, Jimmy Bob, visualized 3,000 years of human history on a 12 hour clock where every minute represents 50 years. So building on this model of time, Grace and Jimmy theorize that revolution as the primary driver of social change is only about five minutes old. Hmm. Time is not a straight line that either propels us forward or a line that we can look at, back at. Um, time is actually cyclical. So, so much of what we do is interconnected because the past, the present, and the future are all part of the same timeline. And so if we take this dialectical approach, liberation as you know, a hundred years process didn't start in you know, 2023 or 2020 or 1954 or 1948 or 1863 or 1492, the different freedom fights are only separated by a few minutes according to them. That means on this giant timeline, land back and the right of return are still nascent. Um, and all of our struggles are closely connected in relation to one another and in relation to the society's impact. So that was probably a little bit metaphysical, but I didn't want to kind of stop there and be like, this is not too right now. I don't know why this diagram is not coming out, but maybe you all can see it. Um, this would just be a cop to make a comparison. Now that I'm going to do it, but I'm sure for some reason. But you can see it, okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, so let's make some connections between Cop City and Cop Academy. Um, it's going to inform the work that we uh, take on in applying tactics and strategies when Cop City 
eventually knocked on our doors um, because of the vote. Uh, like we already have, if the rumors are true. Um, so Ron Emanuel, just like Andre Dickens in Atlanta, used recommendations from the federal government to invest in training and upgrade physical training facilities. The city of Chicago claimed a new crop academy to help improve community relationships um, with police uh, following Black Lives Matter uprising after the video of the Juan murder was released to the public one year after he was murdered. The city of Atlanta claimed its police and first responders needed a new training facility so that it could improve low morale and solve the crime problem. And it was said after the protesters responded to the Atlanta police killing of Richard Brooke, who was murdered by Atlanta police um, Garrett Wolf for allegedly sitting in his car at a Wendy's drive through. They said that they were on fire afterwards, by the way. Um, just like Cox City is built uh, on the same site as the former prison farm, the police academy in Chicago is located in a poor and working class black community that has a long history of disinvestment and political violence. Both Cox City and Cox Academy were democratic initiatives, okay? Ron Emanuel may have started the plan, um, but Lori Lightfoot completed it. Keisha Lance Bottoms may have started the Cox City plan, but Andre Dickens was breaking ground on the project of WP. Both Cox Academy and Cox City are materially supported by multinational uh, corporations that are carceral and they fund environmental renovations. So, for example, the firm AECOM won the contract to build Cox Academy. Even though they had previously been caught defrauding taxpayers and building unsafe facilities beforehand. And Northrop Southern, the company responsible for the train crash in um, East Palestine, Ohio, is one of the top city primary founders. So let's talk about the similarities between the movement to stop poverty and the movement um, against poverty. So they are both largely decentralized and great class in ideology. Uh, no Cox Academy had about 105 organizations in their coalition, like the Five Stars and Beyond Chicago. And not all of these organizations had an abolitionist uh, policy to begin with, but they developed it um, as part of the organization. Both of the movements functioned through a development lens, building on the rich legacy of Black women uprisings against the carceral state, both inside and out of prison. Both movements have multiple tactics on multiple fronts. This includes targeted and broad um, opposition through direct action, speeches, canvassing, youth organizing, high schools and colleges, et cetera. And they both have an environmental justice uh, plan. So, no cost of having organizers invited the Little Village Environmental Justice Board to the Sacramento Land in Garfield Park and the full building and facility there with Alan Land in the Brown community. And the South Cop City has forced to find this kind of increase the one for building and construction with their lobby. Plans for both cop cities have been championed by the city's respective police foundations or the nonprofit of uh, a board that are made up of executives from local and international corporations and a law firm. The Atlanta Police Foundation is the second largest police foundation of the city in the city, and they are bottom-lining the project with help from Atlanta-based corporations, uh, like Chick-fil-A, Michael, and the financing from public bonds. So financing is at the crux of the problem here, um, especially private funding. So let's talk about a recent research, research study that's actually ongoing uh, titled The Social Structure of Private Loan Facilities. Um, if you'd like to read it in its entirety, it's in the syllabus for today. Uh, so shout out to Jenny and Laura and everyone who worked on it. Um, with an increase in organization, we can expect the wealthy and powerful increase a share of access to the state. Um, the reason why Cop City is how it is is because it's an urban group region. So land is an urban regime. It's uh, an urban regime is a concept by Stone, I think, that basically says that the resources of the corporate elite and black middle class are necessary to make the Atlanta government function. So the Atlanta government function is not a separate entity from the corporation that back it. So 
it's not, you know, it's not a democratic elected body that represents the interests of the population. It is, in fact, that they serve uh, wealthy corporations who wield a lot of the decisions and power in the city of Atlanta. So, in short, in Atlanta, privatization is a tool to expand the police state, and Hop City is the encroachment of the wealthy elite in the state of Georgia since the 1960s. Um, so the research project uh, was done through the University of Chicago and the Sanity Center, and Shakhtar, Shandler, Mishra, and Vargas um, really wanted to dig into police finance organizations, which are private entities that channel material resources in support of police departments without facing the same levels of public accountability or regulation or transparency as the police departments themselves. So their methodology used a lot of keyword digging, police terminology, um, open records access on Godstar, uh, ProPublica's nonprofit explorer, um, speeding and coding, going through that 90s and the tax forms, and then digging into the voter media to kind of put, it, put the pieces together. Um, because they wanted to answer the question of what do police foundations spend their money on? Um, and what are the private donation structures of the police? So, as part of the research, uh, they divided police finance boards into three different categories connectors, boosters, and payers. Connectors donate to multiple police departments in major cities, boosters uh, donate exclusively to one police department. Um, and it's usually local police nonprofit organizations who connect donors to a specific locality. And then Havens, which we will talk a bit about now, um, they publicly and materially support police, but they don't necessarily report it. So Havens uh, either operate as a savings account for the police or provide support for the police through tax loopholes running their own programs or making their own equipment purchases. So what do police finance organizations spend their money on? Um, the Haven released at least uh, almost four hundred million dollars in revenue between twenty fourteen and twenty nineteen, but the past data provided very little detail on what the funds are actually used for. Uh, police states will do things like Claim that they're giving gifts, like pay nine, um, safety equipment, and training that are meant to augment and not replace uh, public budget items. So, even if the contributions aren't like mundane, um, these resources can be used to cultivate a coalition of political support for police within communities. So, even if the smallest local uh, sheriff's department or local rural police department can have access to hyper-militarized um, weapons, surveillance technology, et cetera, because of the infrastructure that police finance organizations are building in relationship to local state and federal government. Um, there are four major pathways to private donations to the police, um, according to the research, funding individual officers, calling gifts, um, providing non-material gifts, and I'll explain what non-material means in this case. Facilitating the discomfort to the five police departments, and then loaning equipment and officer groups. So, non-profit donors usually have to disclose donations greater than five thousand dollars, but they don't have to disclose the gifts that they made to individual people, and this also means individual police officers. Uh, the Chicago Police um, Finance Board uses this gap all the time. Um, in 2020, the Chicago Police Memorial Foundation gave police officers 33 uh, hundred bulletproof vests and 1,700 vest covers, which totaled about 1.4 million. But only five of the taxes that year, they documented only giving about uh, 2,800 vests to individuals in our house. So that gave us an idea that they can just kind of skim over the top and report like a minimal uh, gift as possible and not have to say, well, actually, we have spent, you know, 10,000 came on for this particular place, or we gave them two helicopters um, for this particular reason, and then we put it under the cop name. Like, it, it's really insidious, and it's very illegal because of the way that these things are, um, the way that the infrastructure is. Uh, 
non-material gifts, it knowledge and ideas and any value data. Um, and I believe even uh, materials support the beliefs that they don't record it. So payments, they either operate a payment account for the belief or provide the belief um, support to pass the goal. Uh, so they can purchase any training or any equipment. Um, and the public does not know. Like, they can remain unaware of the type of um, weapon, of the type of equipment, the type of training that they're able to do again. Uh, in the case of the University of Chicago, their in-house crime lab shares data and in time with the Chicago Police Department, but the data is not disclosed um, as a gift. So they don't say like what the data is, they don't say what the data is for, they just say, yeah, we can send data, but you know, that's it. Um, so I'm really curious to see like what is the type of data that they get, what type of training that they're being offered. Um, Not material gifts is also a place where police finance or can use their influence over police policy and behavior um, locally and nationally. So they can use them to bring back the under, for example, as a material gift. Okay, this kind of diverged a bit. Um, several police finance organizations, according to the research, have negotiated discounts with police equipment vendors or acted as a third party that allows the department to purchase the equipment at a low market rate. So while this is equivalent to giving money to the department to buy these purchases, by crafting it as a discount, police finance boards prevent these gifts from public disclosure. So a police finance organization on behalf of whatever TV they're funding can negotiate a discount rate for things like armed trucks, um, surveillance drones, or software, which again makes it easy for the small police department with a scrappy budget to have the military style weapon. And the last one is free equipment loans. Um, a donation is often defined by a change in ownership. But if an object is given to someone for them to use and the ownership never changes hands, it is not legally a gift. Uh, the US military's 1033 program, which is the program that allows the department to borrow military equipment for free, police finance organizations use the same tactic. So in practice, a finance board can facilitate a police department to free use of a helicopter without the organization or the department ever having reported receiving it or donating it. So the corruption runs deep here. Um, there are a lot of other insights uh, to be gleaned from the report. Um, and these are some of the questions that researchers have posed uh, that are worth considering. They they themselves say that like this doesn't even crack the surface um, because the data is so well hidden. So uh, they ask, do private donations affect police behavior, crime rates, or like proposed crime rates, um, or public spending on police? How might the effect of a large dollar donation compared to the effect of a small dollar donation? And do police foundations effect vary on city size? Um, I would also like to add to this list what does this look like in the context of New York City? or Chicago or Atlanta, yeah. how does the media play into this? And what are the connections between the giant companies buying our newsrooms and the same giant companies that are aiding to fund um, the news department? Is state propaganda um, part of what is considered a non-material gift? And then do um, the major tech companies uh, and the faculty the algorithms to basically reward the doxing squad that talked to you and acted on that publisher. So a lot of questions, not that many answers, and the structure of blue science organizations are going to go that way. I do want to end on a positive note. Um, we know that the police reform is in terms uh, that is used to usher more funding for cops and to continue harming communities and not harm them, uh, or not equip them, um, with the skill needed to like, not hurt or surveil or assault or kill us. Um, but if that cop city and the no cop academy have broken the lie that the police and the police system equals safety, and they push the rest of us 
to redefine safe to use. Everyone and the planet have access to the resources that they need, not just to survive, but to thrive. That resource distribution from defunding and abolishing prisons, police and militarization, um, and refunding communities is the step that we need to take. Every single fake cop neighborhood has to be transformed into real affordable housing and environment neighborhoods where everyone has to move. And to say the unspoken nature of how deep the corruption and destruction by the police, their donors, and their benefactors are absolutely antithetical to justice and liberation, I mean, have to be very clear as to the infrastructure of our organization and what we are asking for. See, okay, I'm done. Love you all. See you on the streets. See you.